Uh, Ralph, welcome to How to Fix Democracy. Thank Ralph, you. Ralph, does American democracy really need to be fixed? Oh, it's deteriorating by the year. Uh, not that it ever was, uh, uh, you know, shall we say acceptable, uh, but the concentration of power in few hands and, and the many ways they deal with uh, the mass of the people, uh, it has been overwhelming uh, in the last uh, 30 years. So what's happened in those 30 years? You, you sort of, uh, you exploded in American life in the mid 1960s with your, with your still important book on safe at any speed. Since 1965, which is more than 50 years, how has American democracy quote unquote degenerated? Because the plutocrats and their oligarchs in Washington have learned how to block the gates to democratic achievement. For example, they've taken over Congress more than ever, and we could never have achieved what we did in the 60s and 70s if we had the Congress that occurs now, which is indentured to Wall Street, to big money, uh, to gerrymandering, uh, predictable elections for the most case, safe districts, lack of competition. Have, didn't you have plutocrats in the 1960s? You had very wealthy Americans. The, the kind of people who, who may have owned the car companies or the banks back then? They weren't as organized. They didn't have political action committees. When I took on GM, they didn't even have a lobbying office in Washington, D.C. Uh, now they're much more organized, and it teaches us a lesson. When we beat them, they come back even stronger if we don't become more organized. Democracy is all about civic organization. It's not just public opinion. That's important as a brooding omnipresence signaling to the lawmakers that the bulk of the people are behind the few activists that are in the vanguard. But Ralph, isn't that democracy? People organize, the poor organize, you're trying to organize the poor, the working class. The rich also have a right to organize. Well, they have a right to organize, but they don't have a right to rig the system so others cannot organize and confront them. How are they rigging the system? Well, look, we have voter suppression in this country, all kinds of obstacles. Uh, which tend to uh, keep out minorities and, mm. and other dissident groups from being able to vote. We have gerrymandering where the politicians pick their voters. Can you imagine that? Yeah. Uh, whether it's Democrat Party or Republican Party, whoever's in control of the state government. We have very sophisticated, undisclosed campaign cash contributions now. Uh, we have a system that intimidates a lot of people from running for election because it's such a dirty system that's exposed to slander and to libel uh, and to all kinds of obstacles just to get on the ballot. Some of the other people, Ralph, we've, uh, we, we've spoken to in, in this series, uh, Earl Lewis, for example, or Carol Anderson, they, I think, reflect your argument, but rather than thinking in economic terms, they think in racial or cultural terms. Are you convinced that the big problem is money rather than race in American democracy? They're connected, obviously, but uh, class matters uh, more than race matters because it's class that pigeonholes people by stereotypes. Uh, and so the, the important thing to recognize in this country is if you look at all the gateways to democratic participation, democratic achievement, the plutocrats and the oligarchs have brilliantly gamed them to obstruct them. Look how they control consumers through fine print contracts. Look how they control small taxpayers by having a tax system that provides escapes and, and immunities and loopholes for the rich and the corporate. Look how they've done with the workers by weakening the labor laws to a level below any Western country in terms of interfering with the ability of workers to join unions and have collective bargaining against very organized giant employers like Walmart. So Ralph, um, do you think that the politics of, of identity, mm -hmm. of, of gender, of race, do you think that's a bit of a red herring? Should people, organizers, when they're thinking about reforming American democracy, should they be thinking primarily about reforming the economic system rather than the cultural system? Yes, because the reforming the economic system requires reforming the political system. For example, if you want a higher minimum wage, you have to go through Congress or state legislatures, uh, by and large. If you want full Medicare for all with free choice of doctor and hospital, you have to go through Congress. 
if you want to crack down on the ripoffs of by corporations of consumers in all kinds of ways, you have to go through the political uh, gateways. So they go together. That's why we like to use the word political economy. Trump, uh, Ralph, what would you make of the different responses of the working class mm -hmm. to what one might call the crisis in American democracy, or certainly the crisis of the American middle class? How would you make sense of the white working class affection for Trump and this shift to populism? By developing an agenda that does not stratify people and uh, produce alienation among African Americans or have been poor white Americans. That's why we have to have a broad agenda that says, look, all of you, regardless of your identity, are being underpaid, you're being underinsured, you're being disrespected, you're being excluded, <clears throat> you're being uh, taken away from your own property, like the public airwaves, like the public lands, like the public pensions, uh, which own huge stock on the New York Stock Exchange, but it doesn't control any of these corporations. Are we in need, Ralph, and uh, this is obviously a sensitive subject for you, are we in need of a new political party? Can the current political parties, the Republicans and the Democrats, uh, are they able to respond to this crisis, or do we need a third party candidate? We need a third and fourth and fifth party. We have to have a competitive democracy that gives more voices and choices to the voters. Because otherwise you get millions of voters voting for a terrible candidate because they can't stand the other candidate. Namely, they'll vote for Trump because they couldn't stand Hillary Clinton. Uh, and in order for that to work, what you have to do is get rid of the winner-take-all system. You've got to get rid and replace it with proportional representation. You've got to get rid of money nullifying votes and campaigns. You've got to get rid of gerrymandering. And above all, on a presidential level, you've got to get rid of the Electoral College. We're a laughing stock of the world where people can run for president, win the popular vote, and lose the office in the White House, as has happened in 2000 campaign and 2016 campaign to the Democrats. So you bring up the 2000 campaign, which of course you were involved in as a third party candidate. Some Democrats still haven't forgiven you for that. Uh, it's all very, well, they might say, well, it's all very well talking about reforming the system, but in an unreformed system, isn't it irresponsible for third party candidates to run? Not if the uh, major parties adopt their agenda. These are third party candidates who want more civil liberties, more civil rights, living wage, full health insurance, very mundane. Uh, changes in livelihood, however important they are, that Western European countries and Canada have had for years. For years. There's no paid vacation for all workers in this country, unless you belong to a union that's negotiated it. In Sweden, they have seven weeks paid vacation. In France, they have at least four weeks paid vacation. Uh, are they smarter than we are? No, they have a parliamentary system that's more fluid uh, and more leveraged uh, for small party agendas to t steer the larger parties in the direction of the people's interests. Ralph, you've presented American democracy as being in crisis, um, and you're suggesting that they should adopt the European model. But we've had a similar kind of, some people would at least argue, a similar kind of corruption of democracy in Europe, the rise of populism and racism and xenophobia. Do you think you're a little idealistic about democracy in Europe? Uh, or do you believe that really the real problem with democracy is the American system as opposed to the, 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 the general state of democracy, at least in Western Europe? Well, democracies produce in moments of time. They have to be refurbished. And you had a moment in time in Western Europe after World War II when you laid the basis for the social democratic state and the safety net. Uh, but it wasn't sufficiently re refurbished. Why? Because the mass of the people take these advances for granted, and they don't get engaged from the local to the national level. They're not vigilant. They're not watchdogs. And so it isn't so much the system. You can have our system. You can have your system. It's the engagement that's absolutely key. For example, we're supposed to have the right to vote. You're supposed to have the right to vote. But the actual voting process is obstructed differently in different countries 
because the people allow it to happen. Ralph, how to fix democracy. I'm going to give a, a, a reference to your new book, uh, How the Rats Reformed the Congress. Is the way to fix democracy in America to get rid of the Congress? How do we change it? No, it's to use the Congress. If you ask the American people, what kind of changes would you like in America? They would say, well, we'd like a living wage. Uh, we'd like health care for all. We'd like uh, fair enforcement of the criminal laws Why against are corporations. Why they all voted for Trump then? And because they're not focusing on Congress. Because Congress in our system, the smallest branch of government, by far the largest powerful branch of government, and we know their names. There are only 535 of them, 100 senators and 435 representatives. And you know what? There's something they want more than money from special interests. They want your vote. So if we don't organize a vote back home and have summons where we summon the senators and representatives to our town meetings and our agenda, uh, we are going to delegate our power under the Constitution to 535 people who will sell it to Wall Street and other commercial interests and turn the government into a corporate state against its own people. So it's wonderful leverage. It's sort of like a pass in the mountains uh, for people to concentrate Congress watchdog groups, in this book, to make people laugh themselves seriously, we call them Congress rat watcher groups. You can go to ratsreformcongress.org for a very serious set of instructions on how a small number of people, no more than 1% in every congressional district, can organize and change things in Congress, overcoming the powerful corporations, as long as the issues they are furthering are supported by a majority of the people. And guess what? There's huge conservative and liberal support for a lot of changes in this country, from criminal justice reform, to cracking down on corporate crime, fraud and abuse, to living wage, to full health insurance, to a change in the tax system, and above all, clean up politics, clean elections. That comes in at 95%. You sound a little bit like a, a left-wing Democrat one of the, the, the new class of 2018 in, in the House of Representatives. Uh, wasn't last year's election, doesn't that speak of the revitalization of American politics? Uh, preliminarily, uh, the jury is still out. We have to see whether they're serious enough uh, to expand their influence in Congress by connecting with the national and local citizen groups who often their predecessor politicians never connect with. Do you think that in the long run, capitalism mm. is compatible with democracy? Not corporate capitalism. Small business, yes. Not corporate capitalism for, for several reasons. Corporate capitalism has to control anything that challenges them, which means government, labor, union organizing, consumer organizing, access to courts to sue the corporations for defective products under tort law. And they are given far too much power under our system even over small business, disadvantaging small business with tax preferences and other subsidies that small businesses can never get. So I make a distinction between corporate, big corporate capitalism, which is totally antithetical to a democratic society, and small businesses. You took on the big car companies in the 1960s and won. What did you do that people should learn from? First of all, I had my facts straight, and I could uh, Describe them in 30 seconds, one minute, two minute, five minute, or an hour speech, depending on the media. Uh, number two, I asked myself, well, I can get people informed about unsafe cars, how they're dying because there aren't seat belts, there's not crash protection, the tires and handling are lousy. Uh, but all that goes up into the ether. Who's going to make a decision for safer cars? It's not going to be Detroit, because that's the problem we're confronting. It's Congress. So with a laser beam, I went to Congress. I went up and down the corridors. I found the few who supported me. I got the key committees who could have public hearings. I went over to the media and got reporters who got interested in the subject, UPI, AP, New York Times, Washington Post, even the Wall Street Journal. And then I went to the White House, because you need help from the White House. And I got the chief staffer for President Johnson, Joe Califano. So I had this troika. I had Congress, had the media covering it regularly, not looking for a feature Pulitzer Prize, and I had the White House behind me. 
And then I moved quickly so the giant General Motors, like a lumbering uh, Levitan, couldn't respond quickly enough in, in the day's expose. And we got them under regulation. In about six months, the biggest industry in the country was under federal regulation for the first time. And Lyndon Johnson invited me to the White House for the signing ceremony in September 1966. Are the people around today, younger versions of yourself, who are pursuing the same sort of strategy, who impress you, who, when you look at what they're doing, thinking, yeah, those guys are doing it right? Well, they're not doing it right if they are swallowed by the internet as their median. Uh, they've got so the internet's the problem, Ralph, not is, the solution. Because, because you don't meet a member of Congress on the internet. You gotta eyeball a member of Congress. You gotta eyeball someone who works for the Environmental Protection Agency. It's still a very person-to-person -person humanity. And if you are misled that you can push out blast emails and get anywhere, you will continually be misled. And then you'll be dismayed, and then you'll be uh, discouraged, and then you drop out. So your advice to any activists who are watching this is, is don't go online, do it in person. Person to person. The most powerful citizen lobbies in the United States, they don't mess around with demonstrations or protests or emails. It's eyeball to eyeball, 100 senators and 435 members of the House. That's why the NRA is so powerful. And that will never change. It will never change in any foreseeable future. If we start getting the Oculus Rift and augmented reality, you think that's going to change? Do you get behind it and you say, I'm going to crawl up to Congress now and I'm going to get into their offices? <laughs> and what about technology and the internet and Silicon Valley? Is that the the new problem or is it the solution? Is, is Silicon Valley, in terms of its plutocratic power, its corruption of political life, is, is it as bad as Wall Street? Well, it's a, it can be much worse than Wall Street because it can inundate 24 hours a day of your life, which Wall Street can't quite aspire to. Technology has, does not have its own imperative, as you know so well. It depends who, who produces it, who controls it, who understands it. And right now, our technologies like nanotech, biotech, artificial intelligence, all the stuff coming out of Facebook and Google have been controlled by fewer people, fewer people with proprietary data than any technology in American history. And that does not bode well for democracy. It bodes well for controlling processes that are coming at people in such a bewildering manner that they're almost into a cognitive dissonance of surrender. So fixing democracy in America at least, or perhaps around the world, requires what? Regulating Silicon Valley, breaking these companies up? Well, first, it requires equipping people with the power and the instruments to fight back. Uh, it's very hard, once you're in these uh, internet networks, it's even hard just to quit. It's just hard even just to quit. You mean just to give up yeah, just and to, give up your account? Yeah, just to get out. Um, and what we need to do is, I think, is to give the personal information that people give to Facebook free proprietary. So that actually Facebook has to pay for it and there is an opt-in by the consumer, not an opt-out. That's, that's one step. The second is they do have to be broken up. I mean, in the 1970s, if four companies controlled an industry at the level of 70 percent, four companies, that would be a signal for any trust action. Well, what do you think the advertising market that's controlled by Google and Facebook is? I'm told it's over 80 percent. 85. Yes. And there's no attempt because the technology of monopoly is beyond the comprehension of the antitrust enforcers in Washington, beyond the political will of Congress to give them adequate budgets, investigators, and technological know-how. And Ralph, we haven't even mentioned that the, the third company in this, which is perhaps the, the, the most powerful and dangerous company of all, Amazon, Jeff Bezos, worth $150 billion. Personally, what do you make of that? Well, that's uh, what I call com consumer complicity for the, for the convenience of it all. So we're all to blame for, for Bezos' ridiculous fortune. You know, if, if you buy from these people, uh, you're making them possible. Where do you think Bezos gets all his money? It's called consumer dollars. And uh, what Bezos is doing, he's emptying out Main Street 
for ether, for a, uh, an internet of things. Ralph, you've spent 60, 65 years in public office. We began this series in Greece uh, and the, the, the Greek ideal of the citizen, of the engaged citizen participating in the polis. You seem to epitomize that. You've dedicated your life to public issues, to the public space. You don't have any children. You, it seems like everything you do is built around public service. What drives you? How, how do you explain your life? Justice. And from an early childhood, I never liked bullies. I would even interfere to my disadvantage when a 10-year-old beat up a 7-year-old on the way to school. Uh, and I had a lucky choice of parents who said, if you want freedom, you have to have civic responsibility uh, next to it. Can everyone be like you? I keep telling them I have no special uh, traits. Uh, I didn't grow up with millions of dollars. I didn't have any political co connections. I hitchhiked to Washington from Connecticut to start laying a base for the regulation of the auto industry. And every day I try to show people that it's easier than you think people to turn this country around. If you have the right strategy, you know what you're talking about, and you focus on Congress or the state legislature. You have to focus on the formal decision maker that will give you living wage, that will give you uh, full Medicare for all, that will give you equal justice under law, that will give your children opportunities, that will curtail greed and concentrated power. We have the power, you know, our Constitution starts out with we the people, not we the Congress, not we the corporation. That's a huge asset for democracy if we stop delegating it without any conditions to Congress or to the White House or to state legislatures. And we've just got to look at ourselves in the mirror and ask ourselves, why aren't we doing this? Don't we want to do it? What's more important? We certainly have the time to do it, and it's only 1% of the people historically that it's taken to turn the country around representing uh, majority opinion, but we have to have an understanding of the, the details, you see, and it's no more difficult than learning how to play bridge for a championship game. It's no more difficult than learning some of these video game rules that are so uh, bewildering. So I say, wake up, people. It's easier, we think. You need to preserve your rights, to achieve your remedies, and to have the facilities, like workers and consumers and small takers, to band together and organize for democratic power.